Thank you for coming on a Friday morning. The uh, name of my talk is not click here. I just needed the reminder because it's Friday morning. Uh, so if you're here for the uh, Electric Citizen and University of Wisconsin Eau Claire case study, you are in the right place. Congratulations. It's a good win for a Friday morning, especially if you did karaoke last night at the VFW. Um, thank you for coming. So we're going to take kind of a magical journey throughout a lengthy process um, that includes different phases and how we went about thinking, planning, and rebuilding a complex university website for a major university. We'll be talking mostly about the what and the why, but if you want to have more information about the how or you know any details or anything um, that I don't provide here because I'm not going to be doing a bunch of technical speak. Uh, definitely feel free to hit me up, shoot me an email, put up a bat signal with a lightning bolt or however you can get a hold of me. Uh, my name is Adam Fuchs. In case you hadn't guessed, this is a picture of me when I had more but uh, shorter hair. I've been with Electric Citizen since 2015. I've also been drupaling since 2015. That was the year I first attended camp as well. Um, also, weird fact about hot dogs that you can read off the slide happened in 2015. <laughs> I'm not a hot dog fan, but that just amazed me that some, so many. If you're not familiar with Electric Citizen, or EC as I'll be referring to it, uh, we've been working in the Civic Center since 2012. We offer a full suite of services, and we're a team of Drupal specialists and advocates, uh, hence us being here and our support and love of this camp. Who's not here today, unfortunately, they had a scheduling conflict, but they had hoped to join us, is the team from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. So there was uh, a lot of people involved in this in multiple different parties. Um, and for the university, the core team was Whitney, who was the kind of project manager for this project, but her regular job is an online content writer. Mackenzie was a content strategist. Allie is web operations manager. Matt is IS specialist and developer. Also, thanks to the rest of the team, Kent, Becky, Chelsea, Denise, Swink Design out of Madison, Wisconsin. Megan Casey, content strategist extraordinaire, and many more. So this project was actually several different projects. Um, EC initially did a discovery before like the rebuild was even put out um, and things like that. And that was centered around what's going on with your old site. Why are we talking about thinking about redoing it? What do you need? What's working? What's not? At the same time, the university was also going through a major rebrand. So the entire university was kind of changing the way that they look, the way that they think about things, the way that they speak to people. And then we had the actual rebuild of the site. So today we're going to concentrate on the discovery and rebuild phases. And I hope you appreciate my Dolly-generated 80s Miami Vice style transition slides. Starting with the initial discovery, we'll talk about why it was crucial to the health of the rebuild as a whole to even do a discovery. What is the point of it? What do you get out of it? Is it worth it? The current site was a homegrown CMS called Athena. They built it, they owned it, UX hosted it. Um, they were very familiar with it. They were not so familiar with Drupal. They kind of dipped their toe in the Drupal water a couple of times and it felt scary, it felt kind of unfamiliar, and they hadn't really pulled the trigger on it. So one of the key decisions in the discovery is, do we want to keep going with what we have and just rebuild it? Or do we want to try and do a CMS? Do we want to go with something new, something a little more community, a little more stable? Lack of content governance was also uh, a big issue with the old site. Universities have a lot of different pieces to them. A lot of different people have a lot of different say. Oftentimes, all those different peoples and different says does not work too well together when you try and put it all on your website or all on the homepage, as Dan will talk about in 45 minutes or so. Uh, through careful consideration and a lot of communication, we decided that we needed to go with an enterprise-capable, open-source platform, a design that's going to be fully accessible because that's extremely important nowadays. Something also that's exciting, like who are we talking to? What's the point of a university when it comes to a communications department? You want to get new students. You want to talk to your current students. You want to talk to parents, but you focus on the new students. Content editors were kind of hand-tied with what they had. They have a lot of content that goes up. They have a large editorial team. Um, but they didn't really have the tools to do what they wanted to do, so we wanted to address that. 
We also didn't want to have anybody have to write custom code at all, ever, or even be able to. Like, I personally feel that's a very slippery slope when you start having editors whose primary job is not a developer or a designer starting to choose colors, starting to choose HTML that they can add, figuring out how to add CSS into a table to get a layout. Like, no. So we wanted to be sure that people could do the things that they wanted to do, couldn't do the things that they shouldn't do, and felt comfortable doing whatever they were doing. Unlike the 90s band Everclear, we also didn't want everything, everything to be everybody. We needed to, def <laughs> yeah, I messed that one up. Messed that one up. It's early. I've had a lot of coffee. I got here really early because of parking yesterday. So we needed to redefine our audience. We needed to build a site that would serve them for years because also the thing about Drupal now is you don't have to rebuild every time a new version comes out like you used to. But you also don't want to have to rebuild if you are spending multiple years building a giant large project. So we wanted something that would be future-proof as much as possible. Something that's governable and maintainable by a small team. So how do we do discovery? We started with a discovery worksheet to initiate strategic conversations. We eventually led two days of discovery workshops involving a wide range of stakeholders, including content editors, developers, marketing team members, and university staff. Following the workshops, we conducted a series of audits uh, focused around eight key areas. Analytics, content module, design and UX, editorial UX, hosting and DevOps, performance, and SEO. Uh, for content strategy, we did a month of click tracking, several more workshops centered solely around the content and how people were interacting with it, and starting to figure out a framework and a revised sitemap. We delivered an extensive final report that outlined the work done during the discovery phase, the reasons for it, and the outcomes, um, which was actually a really valuable tool for the content team that we're working with because they all have higher ups, and when you ask for you know a lot of money to redo something, you want to have some pretty solid reasons why. Uh, we provided a content strategy framework, new sitemap, CMS recommendation, and some ideas for new content tools. So the main takeaways, as I said, the university was going through a rebrand. Um, what you see here was their old homepage. It was definitely working. Um, they were able to do some of the things they wanted to it, but they felt like it wasn't the most exciting thing in the world to a new student. So the design, design firm, uh, Swink, that was contracted for the rebrand was also used to redesign the site to help tie everything together. A uh, robust content strategy phase was built into the rebuild project timeline to expand on what we started in discovery. Because even though we knew now that we needed content strategy and we kind of knew what we were going to do, we needed to actually do it. A uh, decision was made to move away from the self-hosted custom CMS that the current site was using. Pantheon was decided as the hosting platform because the university wanted a managed hosting platform. They did not want to do it themselves anymore. They also knew that they had needed to have a platform that could handle a large, complex site performancely, something that's going to be fast. New students are on their phones. They might be in rural Wisconsin or you know, Ohio or wherever. Uh, something that also allows multi-dev workflows for testing so that people can be working on things in different environments and not pushing it all the way up to the live site. And something that was also an affordable option and just frankly a little easier to work with than some of the other um, options that explored in the past. So the reason I'm giving this talk at Drupal Camp is we decided to go with Drupal, obviously. Why? Because Drupal is awesome. <laughs> plain and simple, this slide slides it all if you didn't know. Uh, no, but seriously, it's modular, it's customizable, um, it handles the needs of everything we anticipated that we would need in the build, but we didn't have to build all of that from scratch, um, simply because that's not the most budget-friendly way to do things. So we can plug into modules, use them, customize as needed. The upgrade cycle that Drupal has now is also extremely attractive to, to the university and not having to fully rebuild from major version to major version. Instead, you can just make the small tweaks needed to go to like 9 to 10, 10 to 11, uh, 11 to 12, and so on. Also, the site should still be reviewed every few years, so they liked the major version upgrade for that thing. You can't just click a button and all of a sudden your site's brand new again. You have to rethink what you're doing because you do need to put some time in on those major version upgrades. So it was a uh, draw for multiple reasons. So from the UAC team, uh, since they couldn't be here today, I asked them to share some thoughts, and this is directly from them. What they say is we needed a neutral third party to help assess our current CMS 
and determine if it was the right fit for the university as a whole. A redesign of the theme and the content model we needed regardless. We knew that, but we weren't sure if we needed a new CMS as well. It would have been a mistake to jump right into a redesign and possible CMS migration without knowing what was working and what was not working with our current site. We would have set ourselves up to repeat mistakes and not take advantage of the opportunities that come with a new site. In addition, no single department owned the whole website at the time of discovery. So we also needed to need to help working through decisions with multiple departments who needed different needs and priorities. The discovery process was also a great introduction to Electric Citizen, uh, who would eventually work on the rebuild. EC coming in with questions instead of solutions started the relationship off on the right foot and built trust among the team. All right, so strategy. For strategy and design, we're basically shifting from discovery, which was a completely different contract, completely different like project. They didn't even need to go with EC for the rebuild, um, but they decided to, so we took a look at what came out of discovery and what the rebrand was doing for the university as a whole and figured out some key guidelines to follow. We needed to keep in mind that this was more than just a simple website rebuild. The design, the focus, the functionality, and the content module needed to work, content needed to work with the rebrand and the content strategy transformation that was also happening at the university. They were basically changing their whole kind of communication setup and it, everything needed to work together. We also needed to keep in mind our target audience always. We need something exciting but accessible, a little flash, a little style, but not full on 70s leopard print. Uh, it was important that content lead the project. We absolutely wanted to prevent the clutter and navigation difficulties that kind of creep up over the years that they were seeing on their current site. The new site, <clears throat> excuse me, the new site should specifically focus on content directed towards their primary audience. Uh, they started a heavy content audit early on in the process because that was going to be extremely lengthy when you have thousands and thousands of pages of content. Trying to figure out what to keep, what to not is going to be a really large task, especially when that's not usually your primary like job. That's something that I feel like a lot of vendors and a lot of developers forget when we're working on client work. Like oftentimes the people that are involved in the project on the client side, that's, that's not their job. That's just something that they're doing during this rebuild. So they have a lot of extra work on that plate. We gotta figure out how to make it as easy as possible. Um, but once we get content to where we need, how do we keep it there? We needed to set up a clear governance plan that works for everybody. A plan that should be backed up with technical controls so that it's not something that's just, yeah, we're really gonna do this, but by Christmas we're gonna forget about it and everybody's gonna do what they want again. So we wanted edit, editorial, uh, editors to be able to find and work with their content, but only their content, not somebody else's. We knew we'd need new roles, um, new permissions, uh, some review workflows so that people couldn't just put stuff up live and do whatever they wanted. There had to be checks and balances in place. We also wanted to restrict some key tools to just the uh, core communications team. In addition to technically controlling things and you know putting editors where they needed to be, um, they needed to figure out how to edit again. What should they be saying? So we created an extensive playbook uh, to help train current and new editors. The playbook and eventually an eventual training, which would happen um, during the build, should also be backed up by tools baked directly into the site uh, to make things as easy as possible. We wanted to do things like visual previews so that editors could see what they're making as they're making it. And they could see it on different devices because things look very different on a desktop than they do on a phone. Uh, we also wanted to give them simple things like help text. What size image should I put in this field? What's it gonna look like once I do? We implemented focal point cropping so that people don't have to worry about heads being chopped off if the image is used somewhere else. Um, drag and drop functionality for dynamic page creation. And like I said before, we didn't want to or enable people to touch code. So when an editor wants to say, I'm working in the biology department and I want three stories tagged with microbes that are from the biology department on this page, we just gave them the ability to do that by a couple of clicks and some select options. Um, so the key is like the main job of anybody working with a website, that should not be your main job to work with the website. Your main job should be like, putting the content out there and thinking about the content, not trying to figure out how to do it. So with design, content strategy, and site architecture now happening all on overlapping timelines, things were getting pretty kind of messy. 
we knew that we'd need open and clear communication and definitely had to have everybody on the same page because everybody's kind of overlapping, but people are also doing their own work. So we implemented weekly strategy meetings that included key members from all of the teams so that nothing could be lost in translation from one team to another and so that we weren't inadvertently planning or designing something that wouldn't eventually work or wouldn't work well, wouldn't be performant, wouldn't be accessible. Um, a lot of technical things to keep in mind too that are sometimes not thought of in the early planning and the design phase. We wanted to do cool things, but they actually have to work. So rather than costing us time and budget, which was an initial concern if we're doing all of these meetings we hadn't really planned on, we found that uh, adding channels of communication, collaborating more as a team, and having everybody involved, giving everybody a say, uh, saved us a lot of time in the long run. Everybody had a clear picture of what was going on. Everybody was in agreement, and we knew exactly what we were building before we started uh, development. We had a clear schedule of deliverables that we were going to follow, and we knew how the build was going to work um, before we started it. We wanted to be confident before we began build that we were building the site that worked for needs and site management model as well. The strategy phase helped us articulate what we needed and translate those tools into specs that influenced how the site was built. Since we became well acquainted during discovery with what was working on the current site and what was not, and how our editors tended to use the tools we had, we had a clear internal vision for the new content model. The content strategist Megan helped build uh, support content around that vision so we could educate our editors. And we appreciated how custom our strategy phase felt rather than following a prescribed way of doing things. Uh, that's from you, like, in case that wasn't clear. Cool. Sure yes. Does. Thank you. Does that work? No, I think no? that's just for the recording, but I'm not sure gotcha. if the room mic works or not. That's a light. Oh, which one? The one that he touched? Hello? He can talk louder, too. <laughs> yes, I can talk louder. Sorry, I talk kind of quiet and fast, so if I'm going too fast, also please let me know, but thank you. So now we're on to development. Uh, because site architecture was involved in the strategy meetings, we had a very detailed and definitive plan of what we wanted to build. We also knew we were being very, very ambitious and that there would be some challenges to overcome and scope decisions to be made along the way. Besides just the new editorial tools defined in the strategy phase, we also needed to rebuild some of their existing tools. <clears throat> because we're migrating stuff. So if you have all 100% brand new tools, what happens to everything that you had before? Uh, we wanted to make sure that things was, were as flexible and future-proof as possible as well, again, to avoid having to rebuild uh, just a few years down the road. So we shot for the boon rather than planning. We said, tell us every single thing that you think that you want in this site and we'll figure out how it all works together, and then we'll tell you what you can actually have when it comes to the amount of money and the timeline that we have in place. Uh, but because we're shooting for the moon, we also need to identify MVP candidates. What's absolutely crucial for launch, and what sort of things will fit within the entire ecosphere of the tools that we're building, but may not happen for six months after launch, a year after launch, you know, uh, a phase two or a phase three sort of approach. <clears throat> Approaching the build in that way allowed us and UEC to envision everything that could work within this ecosystem, how it all works together, how it all works with the rebrand, the content strategy uh, that we did, and just kind of what is possible even if it's not all being built right away. UEC also has a brilliant developer named Matt um, who ran their old site kind of single-handedly, but Matt was not a Drupaler, sadly. He was in Athena or, or whatever. Yeah, Whatever it would be for their current, their yeah. I just don't know how you make that, you know, er. Um, I say not because he definitely is now. Uh, we included Matt in the build in order to give him some training because he would eventually be running the site. We figured, well, you better learn some Drupal real quick, right? Um, so we identified some tools and areas that he could work on in tandem with the EC development team. Uh, that also gave him the opportunity to do sprint demos, which is something we like to do early and often so that he could learn how to talk about tools. 
pick up vocabulary. He could get some tips and had question inputs with our team. Um, we worked collaboratively in Git, which was also really easy with Pantheon and another decision uh, why to go with them so that we could do code reviews and he could ask questions and commits and everything. Uh, it also helped with some of the budget constraints that we knew we were going to do. If we didn't have to develop everything, now we could give you more stuff in MVP rather than pushing some of it off to phase two. Uh, so that was also really helpful. The content strategy work, as I said, included a complete site audit, but also identified major portions of the site that would need to be written that weren't going away, or just written from scratch because the tools weren't there before or because the um, communication and what we wanted to say wasn't correct before. And that's a huge burden for a small team, so how do we get them into Drupal and working as soon as humanly possible because they have the largest job? So with a huge amount of content to take on, we needed to provide as large of a content entry window as possible. We absolutely wanted the site ready for 24-25 school year. Um, UEC would need time to train their editors, allow faculty and staff to update things like profiles, uh, which is difficult over the summer when a lot of people are gone or doing other jobs or just not available. So we built all of the tools first, and we did a bare minimum of theming, um, what we call functionality theming, or ugly but working. It's not going to look like what we showed you in the designs. It's not going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be tough to work with, but you are going to be able to work with it. All of the fields are correct, so we're not going to have to change data later because we planned everything out ahead of time. Um, so you can get in there and you can work, and with a little bit of trust that we built early on in a project, they know that they'll be able to eventually see these tools come to life as we build and as they enter content. Since Drupal was a new system for their whole team, there was also a lot of value in having them in as early as possible so that they could learn as early as possible. Um, we also did a demo at the end of every sprint before we got them in their training and even afterwards. So everything that we had planned out in a delivery schedule, we said we're going to give you a content placer on this day so that you can place different content um, in customized list. And we would deliver it, we'd demo it, and we'd walk them through exactly how it works on the editorial side, how it is going to look on the uh, theming side. That gives them the chance. Ooh, thank you. There we go. That gives them the chance for early and often input. Like you can plan and plan and plan, and usually that plan is gonna be pretty solid, but always something is going to change. It's very difficult to theorize all of these tools, especially when you don't know the content management system they're going to be built in. So for UEC, they're like, yes, that sounds really great, but when they actually use it, maybe we need some changes. So doing demos allowed them to make those changes on the fly, and we could have them implemented and fixed by the next sprint demo so that they could see, yes, that's great. We now sign off on that. We can now start planning that with our content entry. So having uh, kind of those demos and that delivery schedule allowed them to know, all right, we're going to need editors in place to do our academic program content entry starting January 15th because that's when it's going to be built. Um, so it allowed them to kind of plan ahead as well. Uh, we wanted to also develop as rapidly and accurately as possible, but like I said, changes come into place. So having those demos and kind of just show and tell constantly um, allowed us to keep pace with each other and make changes on the fly before content editors were actually in there trying to edit content, putting stuff in the wrong field, realizing that you actually needed a multi-field or a single field when you built a multi-field and now you need to delete it and they need to redo their work. Not good. So we also needed to migrate. Not everything, um, because not everything can or should be migrated, but we had some stuff that we had to migrate. The old CMS had some tools that translated pretty easily into the new site, which was heavily paragraph-based. Uh, however, they had a lot of content for their general pages that was just raw WYSIWYG, just blobs of content. We wanted to move away from that as much as possible, um, and we wanted to move as much content as possible programmatically to help them with their burden. So we wrote a bunch of migration code to parse HTML and put it into our layout paragraphs that we like, which is basically drag and drop section paragraphs with tools within. Um, this allowed us to get the bulk of the data on the pages migrated into our new site. Some old tools didn't line up so well. They were going to be archived. New tools would take their place. Um, so we did mapping of what we could for their tools that weren't WYSIWYG blobs. Um, they have, Athena has what's called rows, which is actually pretty similar to paragraphs, but a lot of the fields didn't line up. So we did a bunch of uh, mapping, 
so that we could take advantage take advantage of the paragraphs that we built. We could do things like Drupal Media, Taxonomy, that basic Drupal stuff, which really you know shines, um, but didn't really translate to their old system. We also identified things that we could not migrate at all early, so that we had no surprises and we could figure out what needs to be manually done, which is going to add to that content burden um, for the rewrites and the audit. We identified them early. We created a manual migration plan saying this is when you're going to get this content type that we're not migrating. This is when we'll be ready for content entry. This is when the migration is going to end. Here's the content cleanup and review that you have to do. Uh, kind of a checklist that they could follow since this was all new for them. The design, as I said, was very ambitious and challenging. Uh, I would not have believed how difficult it is to make a perfect, perfect 16 degree angle responsive. Um, it kind of took me by surprise. But to work as closely as possible with the rebrand, um, we had to include angles, depth layers, a lot of animations, a lot of decorative elements, just a lot of things that aren't really content related, um, but that are going to draw in a prospective student a lot more than just text on a page. We realized that these challenges, while needed, were not the most budget friendly after we got the full designs. So we needed to make some adjustments or put some other things on hold. Um, we ended up doing both. Thankfully, Matt took some things off of our plate. We put some things into phase two. And we also made some adjustments to some of the tools that they were going to have. Maybe your wayfinding option doesn't need four options. Maybe we can get away with two different styles, uh, some things like that. But also, since we are planned for the moon and we were ambitious at the start, it's easier to take away options and then know that you're going to re-add them later because they're already planned rather than taking what you have and then trying to figure out, well, what else would it be? Because then you start going down the individual co component path and not figuring out the options within the overall system. Since we didn't have, or since we did have to make some budget dif driven choices along the way, it was sometimes difficult to choose between design or functionality, especially with accessibility. Sometimes uh, high design is not super accessible. So how do you make things functional but still cool, but still accessible within a constricted budget. Um, so some of those decisions had to be made along the way as well. From UEC, uh, we loved getting to see the site take shape as it was built. Getting to watch the site come together piece by piece, piece through sprint review meetings gave us the confidence that the site we were building was the one we asked for. We could catch issues in real time and they could be fixed by the next sprint review meeting. The constant show and tell of our site uh, Site build also helped us align our content efforts with the build pace. We knew exactly how long we had to develop all of our academic content, for example, because we had determined a date when that content type would be finished and that content could start to be entered. We were happy to have a bold design, but it did prove to be challenging along the way. We perhaps would have scaled back a bit some of the design if we'd known how challenging it would be to actually implement. We're grateful to Electric Citizen for rolling with the added communication and collaboration needed to work with another, another agency on this project. And in the end, we feel like we have a better site for it. By the way, these are not shameless EC plugs. These are their words, I promise. <laughs> with initial development complete, the focus shifted to finishing content entry and um, content cleanup, training the full editorial team and preparing for launch. Even with the initial development and theming complete, there was still a lot of work ahead. Large portions of content still needed to be written or updated. During the build, we created an online support book that covered both content editing and the technical overview of all of their content site and site management tools. Uh, UEC expanded on that as they brought in their full editorial team. They took control of that and said, okay, this is what we need our people to know. So we trained their core team, their core team trained their editors. It was built right into their site, but we blocked it from public view. This gives editors an easy way to say, oh, what does this thing do? What does it look like? How should I use it? How should I write about it? Um, what content does it expect? We can just click on the support book and it's all right there. Uh, but we wanted to make things easier for people too. Um, and that support book kind of helped doing that. Having people not have to do code or have to make you know, a lot of decisions when they're adding the content made things a little easier. If anybody's watched Silicon Valley, uh, old HBO show, one of the things that always stood out to me is all of like the code groups are like, we're making the world a better place through like thermodynamic whatever, you know, code. But if you can just take away one repetitive task that is frustrating for somebody on a content editing team, like you just made their world a little better place. So it's an attainable thing. 
Whether or not we actually did it is yet to be seen. <laughs> Their editors are still new in this. We only launched uh, August 16th, but maybe, you know, it's something to try for at least. So now that the site is open to full editorial pool, and this was back in like April, um, including faculty and staff, new eyes were asking new questions. New ideas and change requests were coming in post-development. So we had to figure out an agreement that covered the extra work that this would take that we didn't anticipate in the initial build development. Of course, Drupal updates always uh, are fun to throw into the mix. And for some reason, 10.3 seemed very, very rough. Um, hopefully not just for us. Hopefully some other people experience that as well. Or hopefully not. But, you know, it was, it was a rough one. Uh, more editors and core team having more time for extended QA also means that you're going to bind some bugs when you build a site this large. You can't catch everything. So how do we deal with all of this stuff as we're also entering content? Um, we figured out that we're going to need to put in a little extra budget. We're going to need to extend things out um, until August so that we have the most time to enter content as possible. And we eventually figured out that four months after initial development wrapped, uh, we're ready for launch. Everything came together actually really rapidly in the last month. Um, they were a little bit nervous and were thinking about pushing launch and then Editors kind of figured out the stream of Drupal. Things became more familiar. Um, tasks were really easy in the last, I'd say, two to three weeks of content entry went really, really well for them. Uh, we did an early morning launch with a lot of positive feedback, uh, which was a little unexpected because this site was very, very different than their current site, both in the editorial tools, the look and the feel, uh, the boldness. It was just kind of something that took a lot of their people by surprise because they weren't involved in all of the meetings and the whys and how this all came about. It's just all of a sudden, wow, okay. So we actually expected more negative feedback than positive feedback at the start um, because that's also what they experienced the last time they rebuilt something. However, that was not the case this time. Uh, there was definitely a little bit of negative feedback, you know, from some old curmudgeons and whatnot, like why'd you take away the old kind of plain design? But uh, overall, it was pretty positive. Their thoughts, uh, the last redesign at our institution is not remembered fondly. We believe that the memory of this project will be different. We have a new vibrant look that better encapsulates the UEC experience, cleaner architecture and clarified roles of site ownership and maintenance within our institution. Accessibility was very important for this reband, rebuild, which was sometimes a challenge, but we got there. We have the content model governments and tools we need to keep control of the site moving forward. Um, we also improved tools for editors, training, and communication with campus as a whole around the site. Final thoughts. Know what it is that you want to do and find the people that can help you do it. And then trust those people once you do find them uh, on all sides of the projects. Clients have to trust us. We have to trust them. Everybody has different expertise. Uh, everybody knows their job. Listening to them and trusting them to know and do that job is going to lead to a better project overall. Um, it's going to be a better experience for everybody. Stick to the vision and goals and trust your team when they offer guidance on how to achieve them. Empower people to make decisions. Uh, the people that work with the site day in and day out often have the best ideas about what needs to change or what's going to work for them. Communicate early, often, and more than you think you need to. Meetings take time, but having all parts of the team involved in key decisions helps keep everyone on the same page and everybody understanding why things are going the way they're going. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, who did you guys leverage for the accessibility scanning? So we do that internally. UEC also has a team member that became an exhibit accessibility uh, proponent uh, on their team, so they did manual testing. Uh, thank you, by the way. My, yeah. my youngest kid is looking at colleges, so we've been using the site. Oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. Looking at you up there. Um, I was just going to say, uh, in the past, when I've done like big replatforming for universities, we have these great goals about not having code, having these specific designs that everyone use. And then we get, <coughs> excuse me, and then we get to like some departments and there's a faculty member with millions of dollars of grants and they're like, no, my picture's not high enough or I need, the, I need this to be something different. Did you run into that kind of stuff where you've got uh, <coughs> certain people?
people who wanted to blow away the well thought out plan? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. And that did come up in faculty bios, um, for sure, and just bios as a whole. Um, bios are pretty much always tricky because some people do need to be up higher. But how do you make those people be up higher and still make everybody else kind of work within their thing within a Drupal view? Um, so we figured out ways to allow them to make custom lists of bios very, very easily. Um, with just, hey, I want to show a list of biology department staff. I want it to be random. I want there to be six of them. I want it to swap out whenever, or it should be alphabetical or whatever. And editors can do this all through the UI. Um, so that was one way to solve it. The other way to solve it was UEC fighting a lot of political battles with their people on their campus. And I do not envy them for that. They had a job. Uh, they did it very well, and they said, like, the main directory is going to be alphabetical. That's how it's going to be. Um, we use search API for it, so once you do a search, it's relevant face. But at the start, it's last name. Um, that's just how it's going to be. So they fought a lot of those battles on their front and won pretty much most of them. And then we implemented some tools to allow some customization and allow people to do some of what they wanted as well. Um, you said that when you were building the, you started with just the having the content entry, uh, content editors enter things, and then it not looking mm -hmm. very good. How much did you cut? Did you just do like take the theme default and let it look ugly and have them, or did, and then you provided like uh, designs? to show what it would look like in general? Or how did you do that? Because I have working now with higher level people who cannot visualize mm -hmm. <laughs> when I do that. Yeah, it's it's a very, very common thing. And this is actually an approach that we do quite often um, because content entry, we've come to realize, is often the largest part of the job. And the most likely thing to push out a launch um, is getting all your content correct. So we had the mock-ups. And we could show them as we demo the tool um, you know, in real time so that you can say, this is what it's going to look like. Here's how it works and the data that you're going to be entering. So we're making sure that all of that is correct. And then we did uh, what I call functionality theming. So does it have the layout it's going to have? Not all the spacing is right. The fonts may be off. The colors may be not there yet. Um, but you can kind of see the layout. You can get a feel for what it's going to be. If it's a slideshow, it's working. If it's a custom list, it's pulling in the right things. Um, so that you can see how it works and you can look at what it will look like in the static designs and hopefully make that mental leap. And a lot of it is just trust too. Like, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting things in there, but we want to get you in there as early as possible. So kind of got to go out on a little leap of faith, which is scary for people sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that there was a great big content audit that happened with a lot of people who that isn't really a main part of their job. Mm -hmm. Did they go about that? Do you know? And do you have any tips for if there are? I'm in a project right now where we're having to go through an enormous amount of content. Mm -hmm. for a and then we're looking at it, and it's kind of looking like a mountain. Yeah. Anything that can help. Um, any ideas for what helped this group? Yeah. So I was not deeply involved in the content strategy um, part of the project. But what we did is uh, the content strategist kind of gave them a playbook that said, here's what we've identified in discovery as your primary audience. Here's the tools that you're going to need to enter content to speak to that audience. Here's kind of how that relates into different content types. And then also figuring out what's the most important content that we know we need to have exactly right on the site at the time of launch. And what other content can we bucket into like a phase two or a, hey, this is going to be there because it's important content, but it doesn't need to be written exactly right uh, at launch. So kind of figuring out those MVP and later content goals. And if you can get them all in, great. But start with the MVP. Make sure that's right. Then do the other ones. And then also figuring out who you're speaking to, um, mostly and what tools you need to do to do that. I'd say would be some good things to follow. Dan probably also has some ideas because he oh, does some content yeah, strategy as well. I, I think just having our content strategists work with their team to sort of and initially sort of help train them in best practices so that they were able to take on a big part of the work. If you're talking about like the content audit itself uh, and the content inventory, it's, it's a huge job and, and it didn't make sense for us to do that. So what we did is we did, we, we started the process, showed them you mean like a hundred pages or so and then said this is how we do it, here's the tools we use, here's the approach we use and then, and then uh, offer guidance to their content team from there. As a follow-up, when you mentioned 
phase two, in this project, did you have kind of a set date, like this is when phase two is likely to happen, or is that more of this will happen in the future? Yeah, so we had an initial build timeline of April. The site was going to be built in April, and we met that. Um, they realized in like January that they're going to need several months after that to finish the content entry. So we actually considered phase two, the time in between April when the initial build um, ended and the initial build budget ended, and the time of launch. So they came up with an interim pool of budget for us to work on items that would have been phase two. Um, during that time so we could actually get those in before launch even though they weren't considered part of the original build so we did that usually there's almost always a phase two it seems like you know um usually you can take care of that through like a support contract later if it's small stuff or generally you know a month or two down the road um, you figure out how things are working redefine what you actually need in phase two if you have to and then approach it from there yes yeah so you, the project was around 26 weeks long is what you said, or is that the just build, the build? Just the build. Yeah, the whole project from the initial discovery phase to launch was a little over two years. Wow. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about the staffing approach and how many people were on that team was like from start to finish? Like how many people? Was it 40, 20 front end, back end developers? Like QA? Like yeah. Um, design? All of the people. Sure. So initial discovery was Dan and the other EC co-founder, Tim, mostly working with the core UAC team um, and some of their stakeholders on campus. The um, initial three, three of us. Three so, of us. Yep. Oh, yeah. Megan was involved too, yep. right? Yeah. We had a content strategist yep. looking at the content for best practices. I was looking at design and, and user experience, and, and then um, our technical director was looking at it from technical perspective and what their technical needs were. So that was just a team of three with mm -hmm. their team. And then... Um, from there, once we started, uh, from our team, what would you say, anywhere from six to seven people were involved? In yeah, depending upon the project phase, because um, we had, after the initial discovery, then we had design, which was third-party Swink um, from Madison. We had the core UX team, mostly, which was anywhere between four to six people, depending upon what we were talking about at the time. And then you had the EC team, which was content strategists, um, me uh, for architecture. And then once we started to get into development, we had five developers. Um, we had somebody doing migration, uh, back-ender, um, two front-enders, and then site building. Got it. Did you have one person consistent or a couple people consistent for the two years? Um, Kind of yes and no. We did a transition from the initial discovery because that was a separate project to the build. Um, so Dan and Tim and Megan were involved in that. Megan and Tim were involved in the initial discovery and content strategy during planning. I also came at that in at that point, and then um, I stuck with it throughout uh, launch. I think we did maybe transition a different project manager in on that. Yeah, we also we did transition project managers, just some HR stuff uh, in the EC but, team. So. But, uh, other than that, it was consistent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, I see some pros and cons with the moonshot strategy. Is that your normal like project management style? I wouldn't say that we really have a normal style. Um, we build sites very custom. Um, we build what you need. And sometimes those needs are very easy to identify, sometimes they are not. In this case, they really weren't. Um, since they didn't know Drupal, they were just starting their content audit and that sort of content strategy stuff. They didn't really know what they needed as far as tools. We had some ideas, some things that we did know, but we wanted to be able to, and, and they knew that this is something that they want to be able to work with uh, for a long time and be able to expand on. Um, and bring some other departments in, some subsites in the future potentially. So we told them, let's plan everything, but we're not going to build everything. That way, they, as they support the site going forward, um, have kind of the plan in place, even though we couldn't build it all. Yeah. Drupal is, I, I really like Drupal, but it does have a long learning curve. Uh, how mm -hmm. are the, the people in Eau Claire, they were starting from zero with the Drupal? Yep. How's that work for them? Are they feeling confident, whatever? Yeah, they, 
the core team really, really likes it. Um, the admin interface is a lot easier than what they used to have to work with. Um, the tools are easier, they don't need any code. Their developer also really likes it because he can ask open source questions and get answers now. If he has a Pantheon question, he can ask them. If he has a build question, he can ask us. Um, so he's got a lot of support where before it was just kind of him doing his own thing in Athena. Um, so they feel a lot more supported. Their editors and faculty and stuff are still getting used to it, as I said, but uh, I think overall that they're very happy that they went with Drupal. Josh. Um, yeah, so follow up to that question, uh, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your process for involving the, the internal developer mm -hmm. uh, in, in the project and like, you know, from them, you know, training, getting them up to speed training and then how did you, you know, work with them through the process? Sure. So Matt um, was a kind of back-end PHP guy, didn't really know site building, didn't know a lot of theming, although he could do it, didn't know Drupal at all. So we early on suggested that he get on board with Drupalize Me, which is a great tutorial system for Drupal. Um, so he started doing that. He also just worked a lot on his own to learn things. Um, but as we figured out what tools we were building, we identified specific things that were kind of their own thing. Like we wanted a jobs content type. It wasn't gonna be an MVP deal, but it was self-contained. It didn't really affect the rest of the site at all. It's just a content type and a view and something that he could kind of sink his teeth into early on. Um, and as he developed it, we didn't really give him like a schedule or anything, just like, hey, do the best you can. We're here with questions as um, you have them. And then we internally dev reviewed the work that he was doing um, every time he requested it so that he could know that he was building in kind of the right way so that it did fit with the rest of the site, even though it was kind of its own sort of entity. Follow up to this question. So I, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. Did you do? Did, did you do the same approach with like their content team, like a content strategist shadowing you? We. Someone? We didn't have anybody really shadowing their content team, although Megan was involved in the planning and was there for questions if they needed it. But she built an extensive playbook, um, like extensive playbook. Here's your entire site from a content strategy perspective and how you write for it and what sort of tools. And we also built that into the online support book that we built for the technical side so that they could you know, easily look up things that they needed to, to find if they had a question. They don't have to try and figure out where the book was and what page it was on or whatnot. Um, so we tried to make it as easy as possible and it seems to be working for them. Yeah, Matthew. Uh, another pain point I know is content and people have mentioned that a few times, but I was, well, when we built sites, when we get to the end, then it's, then they do content. So mm -hmm. like we hit the technical deadline, but then they, they're like, oh, content can't do that. It's gotten to the point where we encounter that so often. We actually mm -hmm. have a whole content entry team of folks ready to go when clients can't do that. But I was just curious, did you allow content to be a blocker for launch? Um, not a blocker. So we got them in as early as possible, as early as we technically could. As soon as we were able to start the migration, we trained them on how to enter content for the things that they would manually clean up from the migration and the things they needed to write from scratch. However, with such a large content thing to do, we finished the technical side completely and the site was 100% built and themed as they were about halfway through their content journey. So that was really on them and on what they had defined on as MVP content um, early on in the content strategy process to figure out what day do we think we can, need, we can get this done by to make a fall semester launch. Um, how realistic is it? Let's give ourselves a little leeway time. So that was kind of on them to figure out their resources. Can they pull in some students to do some library content entry and you know things like that, um, which I think they actually did. So it was kind of a, a marriage between what tools can we give you as quickly as possible, what do you still need to do after the site is done, as you mentioned, and how many resources do you have to do it? Yeah. I've got a comment and a question. My comment is that um, uh, I work for the Minnesota Department of uh, Children, Families, and Youth. It's a new administration. Uh, there's a lunch flavor that the governor uh, wanted to have a, a department focused on children, families, and youth. Uh, as part of that standing up the administration, we did do a website in Drupal, and I'm going to put in a shameless plug for Electric Citizen. We appreciate it. We, we did, and it was, it was, ours wasn't as big, it was faster, um, but Electric Citizen was a really helpful part. Uh, my question is, did the architecture stay the same 
or did you have did how much of that changed and were there surprises at the end about involving we don't have a place for this yeah um there weren't really any surprises since we did plan for everything that they could potentially want as well as everything that they currently had at the start so we kind of had a holistic build planned out even though we couldn't launch it all but yeah plans changed along the ways um really when we did sprint demos that's where a lot of change happens because this is the first time you're seeing things out in the wild um so you can really see well we thought it was going to work like this but we actually need you know that select list to be an autocomplete because we're going to have 80 things available in that field or you know our wayfinding should include like an option to switch it from left to right because we want to be able to do that now um so things did change but the amount of planning that we did and the amount of conversations that we had with their team throughout that process helped them to really figure out as well as possible kind of what was going on in our heads when we're imagining what this designed thing is actually going to be when it comes to the fields you're going to enter in Drupal um, and kind of talk through some of that with them during that planning process. So we, we avoided a lot of the change that might have happened, but yeah, there was definitely some. And then you kind of roll with it. You figure out, all right, you're actually adding a lot of new functionality with this change, so we're going to need to drop something else to phase two. Or you're actually making things simpler so we can bring something else up and we can have those conversations all the way throughout the build, um, which is really nice. Yeah. Good question. Shadow sites, do they have those? We certainly do. And that's what happens at a university, especially mm -hmm. when they're not satisfied with the original website. And you know, that's some of those things where you can't always deal with it. I don't know if they do have it. Yeah. They, they do. Um, they have like an athletic site. They have a library site. Um, they have a county extension or institution. Um, Barron County um, has a special website of their own. They wanted to have the ability to be able to do some of that in future, but they knew it wasn't in scope in the current thing. Um, so we built some tools in to kind of help them plan for how that might be brought in, whether it's a microsite, whether it's a full subdomain, whether it needs to be its own thing, kind of help think through some of that and plan through some of it, but we didn't build it in this build. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as part of this project, were you utilizing a design system? We did not do the design. Um, for this. So that was a third party um, uh, named Swink out of Madison because they worked on the rebrand with the college. So they did the website as well. I'm sure that they followed some sort of system, like it's very gridded out. We use very, you know, strict angles, um, there, things are spaced consistently. Official, there's not an official but yeah, design system for I don't, the website. Uh, but I mean, there was clearly a brand guideline. Yeah. That, but uh, to answer your question, yeah, there wasn't. So web editors aren't using like. Well, they are. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking you were thinking of a, a separate system, but he can speak. Yeah, to we, we didn't base it off like, you know, this design system or something. It's a completely custom design and build. But the tools that we built work with the system without allowing editors to break it. Like you can choose the background color you want on something, but it's a design background color. Kind of like Steve was talking about uh, in his lightning talk, you know, let's have the developers work with the content people and the designers to choose the blues. Uh, we very much took that approach and we documented out all of those things in the support book so that they can say all right don't make six striped components one after another on the page like that's not going to go go well for somebody trying to read it instead maybe use like this gray with you know a white and then this blue or something like that so we kind of tried to give them as much guidance as possible but still some freedom to do what they wanted to do so there is a system in place but it's its own custom system so this is that public? No. Nope, it's online, but obviously since it's just for the university, we hit it behind uh, access denied, so you have to be logged in to use it. Just curious about, uh, you know, related, it's kind of related to the design question, but also about the writing, any kind of style guides expected, like, you know, my, my big faith is like really long, long titles. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> You know, in a, in a header, you know, really long headers. I mean, sure. That's not helpful to anyone, but the style guides, you know. Yeah, it's not, but it's also that. like the toughest thing at a university because people are very wordy. <laughs> Um, especially at a university. <laughs> so it was a difficult thing. Like some of their story titles are quite lengthy. Um, and some need to be. Some you just have to have that. 
So we gave them the room to do that. We didn't put a lot of technical, like 255 character limits or, you know, six to eight words in place. But we have that content playbook, and that playbook is online along with the um, support book. So that editors can see, okay, I'm putting in a wayfinding widget. Here's how long the text should be. I should have two to three sentences that explain where you're going to go and kind of what you're going to get when you get there. The header should be six to eight words or something like that. So there is a lot of that available to editors, but there's not a technical, like, you must do that uh, in yeah. place. And we did the same thing for accessibility, too, because, like, an editor knows their job. They're not an accessibility specialist. They're not a designer. They're not a content strategist. So providing as much guidance and when you can technical checks is um, something that usually works really well. You get a lot of really good tips and learnings. If you were going to jump in a time machine and go to the beginning of the project, what would be the number one tip that you would give to the team? Do not use a 16 degree angle <laughs> <laughs> in your website. Um, but if you do, 29VH will give you an exact 16 degree angle on a responsive element. Uh, I would say plan out the things that you absolutely need the most plan out the things that are like to house and get sign off on that plan from everybody as high as you can go that's going to be involved in any sort of decision making because there were some shadow people you know that like hey we kind of really thought it was going to be this they did a really good job on their side of limiting that as much as possible but there were a couple times where we needed to revamp things simply because somebody made a decision somewhere that wasn't involved in all of the planning um, so it does happen, but get as much sign off as you can on what you're going to build and what you want to build uh, ahead of time. That way it just kind of smooths things up. Thank you. <laughs>